Hey guys, so we are digging deep into heart failure. So um, this is the second part of my heart failure longer lecture um, where we're going to talk now about types. So we've talked about what heart failure is, that the body tries all this stuff to do to compensate, um, and it just makes things worse. So when we're looking at this, um, I talked in the last video about how you do not need to know about like systolic, diastolic, you know, there's a lot of different types of heart failure. What you do need to know is left versus right. Now, this is my little soapbox. I talk about this in all my videos. You'll get used to it. Um, this is that when it comes to left-sided versus um, right-sided heart failure, like in real life, someone doesn't tell me like in report, they have left-sided heart failure, right-sided. It's just, they have heart failure. Um, and in reality, a lot of these patients, anyone who has left-sided usually accumulates, gets right sided at some point. So there's not the big differentiation, but in nursing school, we do like you to know that there could be a difference one day in one patient, possibly, potentially. So um, for this, you will need to know the difference is what I'm telling you is know this. So there is, um, there is officially left-sided heart failure and then right-sided heart failure. And the way that you can look at this more simply is left-sided is that the fluid backs up into the lungs. So left is the lungs where right-sided heart, heart failure, fluid backs up into the body. So think right is um, the rest of the body or the rest of the body is not right, if that helps you. So let's look at each of these individually. So left-sided heart failure, this patient's going to um, complain that they can't breathe, um, that um, especially that they can't breathe when they lie down or lie flat. And if you remember what this is called, it starts with an O, it's right over here, orthopnea. And these are not my pictures, by the way. So all credit and um, everything to whoever made these, they're beautiful. I could never... Imagine, I promised myself I wasn't going to do that again. So I'm going to stop. I'm going I'm to put my hands down so I can't do the weird kissing thing that I just did. Um, I don't think I'll ever recover from this. So um, on top of that, uh, what do you call it? Um, this orthopnea that they have, it's like you could see everything's like respiratory related. And so um, when it comes to it, like all these symptoms and stuff that you're seeing um, are all about, um, you know, the respiratory system. The other symptoms that are going to be specific to left-sided heart failure are going to be things that involve the lungs. So I'm going to listen to the lungs and what would I expect to hear? A wet sound. So don't get this mixed up. Remember that wheezes, strider, um, and um, uh, any sort of, I feel like there's another one, wheezes, strider, Maybe it's just a wheezes and strider are all about a narrow airway. That's asthma, COPD. That's not what's going on here. What, oh, maybe it's wet lung sounds. I have three right, wet lung sounds. So you want to think wet lung sounds because I am filled with water. Effectively, what's happening here is the heart is backing up into the lungs because think of a traffic jam. Do not think of heart failure like there, literally stuff is moving backwards. Stuff is backing up. So think of you're in a traffic jam and what happens? There's an accident here and all of the cars back up behind that. And eventually there's this long trail of cars. Cars, um, on the highway. And that's the same thing that's happening here. So you have to think about if it's the left side of my heart, what does the left side of my heart, where would the traffic back up into? The traffic is going to back up into the lungs. And so um, if we have a fluid backing up into my lungs, it's going to have a wet sound. I don't know why it says wheezes here. It shouldn't say wheezes. I don't know why they always got to mess me up like this. This is still a beautiful graphic brought to you by someone else with a, as a genius. But for nursing school purposes, always keep in mind um, what we're going to expect to hear from them is wet sounds. Coarse, crackles, ronchi are the sounds that you would be listening for. So just ignore the wheezes that's on that picture. Um, we're going to do a thorough respiratory assessment on this patient because that's where most of their symptoms are. And then the other assessment we want to do is a neurological assessment. And so this would be like how awake they are, um, their orientation, because you have to think about it both ways, is, is that there's this backup of fluid into the lungs because what backs up from the left ventricle is, is the lungs. That's what would happen if traffic backed up in the um, left ventricle. Um, but there's also um, an issue that blood is not pumping forward. If I'm not getting blood out, um, that's going to affect my cardiac output. And if my mind, um, my, my brain is very sensitive to changes in pressure. And so if it's not getting enough pressure, it's like, I'm passing out, bro. Like I can't do this. Um, it can also cause confusion. So on the other side with right-sided heart failure, so we talked about left, if there's a traffic jam, it's going to back up. You have to know your anatomy to understand this. So I have anatomy videos or like, um, uh, you know, assessment videos that talk about the cardiac anatomy. Feel free to watch those if that's helpful. So, but you want to think about right-sided heart failure. Um, you want to think about the right 
ventricle. If there's an issue there, where would traffic back up? We have your right ventricle, we have your right atrium, and then we have the rest of the body. So that's where um, the right-sided heart failure symptoms come up. So the patient may have a lower appetite, they might have a lot of swelling, um, in their body and their legs, because that's where it has to back up into. It's mostly rest of the body symptoms. Um, and so aside from that, um, like the, when I'm talking about rest of the body symptoms, you're going to look at the decreased appetite. Let me back up here. Decreased appetite is related to the fact that they have all this extra fluid on their stomach. And so it's literally putting pressure on their stomach where their stomach is smaller and it's going to cause, um, you know, those GI like symptoms where they're just not going to feel like they want to eat. There's too much pressure there. There's also going to be a lot of swelling in their body because again, it has nowhere else to go. Um, the priority assessments that I want to do on top of this, I'm going to look for ascites, which is like, it almost looks like a pregnancy belly, this very swollen um, stomach, and then a leg edema as well. Um, but on top of that, I'm also going to look for what's called JVD. So like, you know, when the heart, when it thinks back up, they can back up appearance by neck or down. So we've already talked about the ascites, so the stuff, the abdominal symptoms that they're going to have, the leg symptoms, but what can also happen is what's called JVD or jugular vein distension. This is not something you need to palpate or touch. You shouldn't be touching on patient's neck. I'm not going to go on that tangent, um, but what you want to really think about is, is what's happening is, is like literally there's, there's just a continuous backup on this highway of your blood vessels, and so the neck veins get very distended, very full, um, which um, is just a sign. And so you'll see them, like usually you ask them, you want them sitting like 30 degrees degrees or less, something around there. And when you lie them down, just have them turn their head to the side. You can shine a flashlight or you can usually see it. Um, it's just going to look like a big torturous vein, almost like a varicose vein. It's going to be very full, like a very plump vein. Um, you're definitely going to be able to notice it very easy. It's not going to be something that you have to sit there and be like, huh, like you're going to see it when you see it. Like and sometimes I've had patients, they're up at 60 degrees and I can still see it. And I'm like, mm, that traffic is backing up. So that's right-sided heart failure. So how do we know someone with heart failure is getting better or worse? So of course, um, depending on the type, left versus right, um, they're going to have different signs that they're either getting better or worse. So better would be decreasing edema, improved oxygenation, you know, signs that they're not working so hard, like, you know, their um, work of breathing, accessory muscle use is better, um, and tolerating activity, like maybe they can do activities of daily living a little bit easier. Signs that they're getting worse are going to be that, they're, of course, the opposite. Their edema is getting worse. They're breathing harder. Their oxygen levels are going down. Um, and specifically for heart failure, you're going to want to know this. And this is for our textbook. So if you don't go to my school, use your textbook. But a weight gain of three pounds over two days or three to five pounds in a week. So students get this confused because, like, you know, sometimes we'll give you a problem or something that says, hey, it's been a month. And you guys see it and you're like, mm, you know, you're trying to do all the math, like it really stick to this. So like if they gain two pounds in a week, it's not enough to be concerning. Um, but it, once it gets up to that three pounds, that's when it gets concerning. So really look at your time or if it's been a couple weeks and they've gained a couple pounds, maybe that's OK. How much have they gained per week? Um, so really thinking about that or do the math there. If we give you like, hey, it's been a month like, and, and they've gained 10 pounds. OK, that's two pounds. I was like, I don't want to do that wrong. It's like two and a half pounds a week. Um, that's still not, let's see, two and a half times four. Yeah, I'm probably not doing the math well. It's late, forgive me, but you get the point. Like, you know, you have to always do the math, like count, like if it's four weeks and 10 pounds, so maybe I should have done one that's easier. Let's say that they gained eight pounds in, uh, what do you call it? Sorry, I was answering a text message. Let's say that they gained eight pounds in a month and I'll make it easy on myself so I don't have to do math. Um, eight pounds in a month and then there's four weeks in a month. Um, so then you have to sit there, they've gained two pounds a week that's not enough to warrant like a concern. It's not that we don't need to do anything with those patients. We might need to watch a little more closely with their eyes and O's. Um, but what you want to think about is um, um, you don't have to necessarily be in crisis mode because these people are going to gain weight as long as it's not over these. It's not like if it's over these, it's more like we need to do something right now. Um, but if it's um, under these, it doesn't mean we don't need to do nothing or anything. I think that's the proper grammar. It's not that we don't need to do anything. Um, it's just um, we're going to maybe keep a closer eye on their salt intake, look at their eyes and nose. Um, that would be more appropriate. Um, one other thing that's different um, with heart failure is that they can have a cough, especially with that left-sided heart failure, they can have a cough um, with, um, uh, what do you call it, um, as a symptom. But we do worry if they have an increased cough, because this can actually be a sign of pulmonary edema. So if they're having like a really, I'm not talking about a nagging cough, like ACE inhibitor kind of nagging, but just increased or worsening cough, um, it could be an early sign of pulmonary edema. So we may want to get a chest x-ray, start looking at their fluid load and looking into that. 
So what are the complications that a patient can have with heart failure? So some of the things I've talked a little bit about some of the worsening signs, well, what could this lead to? So um, of course we can have fluid accumulations. They can have fluid in all the wrong places. So we can have things like this pleural effusion, like we learned about in the last section. Um, they're also very high risk for dysrhythmias, especially atrial fibrillation, water, fluid stretch, the heart not pumping right, all affects electricity. If I have this really big, juicy heart, um, electricity is not going to flow the same way that it used to. They're also going to be really high risk for deadly dysrhythmias like VTAC, VFib, and sudden cardiac death. Um, so they're going to be really high risk for... Um, their heart's going to be very irritable. It's full of fluid. It's not squeezing well. It affects the electricity. Um, also, blood is pooling, so they're high risk for blood clots and strokes. And we're going to talk about this. So this does not mean that every patient in heart failure is on anticoagulants. Only certain ones of them are. Um, we'll talk about that. But do not think heart failure anticoagulants. It is not um, a necessarily an always thing. It's not even an often thing. It just depends on the patient. Um, and then decreased perfusion to organs. And this is the big thing. And so like if my heart's failing, my brain's not getting fed, my kidneys aren't getting fed, you know, all my vital organs aren't getting fed. Um, so it leads to like multi-organ failure. So let's do an application check. Um, so a nurse is caring for a client with left-sided heart failure. Um, which assessment finding would warrant immediate action? So it's left-sided, so left is lungs, and it's, it's asking me which assessment finding would warrant immediate action, which means some of these might sound bad, but which of these do I need to respond to right now or the patient could die or have something serious happen? So the first one is the nurse auscultates crackles in both lungs. Well, I'm going to assume, um, not assume, I, I hate using that word, but I am going to say that um, uh, left-sided heart failure, um, you know, like they're supposed to have um, wet lung sounds, like it's expected. Um, so I don't see any, you know, necessarily sign of like horrible respiratory effort, et cetera. Um, the next one is the client complains they feel tired. Um, so I'm um, feeling tired. That's going to be expected with left sided because they're going to have less energy because they're pumping less cardiac output out. Um, the next one is the nurse knows they have three plus pitting leg edema. So while this would be expected for heart failure, I don't think it's expected for left side um, heart failure. And what I haven't, I haven't brought it up yet, but left sided can actually become right sided um, with uh, intensity of um, left sided can actually um, get worse to the point where they end up in right sided, um, left and right sided heart failure. So to me, this would be a sign of they're getting worse, but let me look at the last one. The client says they feel thirsty. So this is one of the hardest things, heart failure patients, they're going to feel thirsty, partially because usually they're on diuretics, but also because they have fluid, but it's in all the wrong places. So because they are they're not getting fluid to their tissues. Their, their tissues are like, I'm thirsty, man. Like, where's my fluid? And so um, they're going to feel thirsty all the time. We'll talk about some stuff we can do to help them with that. But the only, all of these are expected. They're going to be thirsty. They're going to feel tired. They're going to have wet lung sounds. The only thing that's not expected for left-sided heart failure is this leg edema. This would be for right-sided heart failure. And so it could be a sign they're getting worse. All right, I'm going to stop there. The next videos will be, video will be over diagnostics. I'll see you there and hopefully without the weird, you know, thing. I'm really working on myself. I'll join a support group if needed.